So recently I got to go on what was essentially a field trip for adults to the Dallas-Fort Worth area to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the JFK assassination. And while you're probably thinking, well, that doesn't have a lot to do with food, it actually does because we know exactly what he had for breakfast on that last day. So I thought I would share the story of that morning with you as I recreate the last meal of President John F. Kennedy. So thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video as I make breakfast for the president. This time on Tasting History. So the reason I got to go on this historic field trip is because National Geographic has a new documentary coming out called JFK One Day in America. It comes out this Sunday, but they wanted me to see it a little bit ahead of time. And not only did I get to watch the documentary in the very theater that Lee Harvey Oswald was apprehended, but I also got to visit other sites associated with that day and stayed in the Fort Worth Hotel where the president spent his last night. He was staying in room 850 at the Hotel Texas, which is now the Hilton Fort Worth. And while he was attending a big breakfast with nearly 2,000 guests, he actually did most of his eating in his room before the event. And the man who took his order for breakfast was named Marvin Love, and there is actually recording of Mr. Love talking about the order. The president's breakfast was ordered by his valet, which told us that he would want five-minute egg, boiled, crisp bacon, orange juice fresh, coffee with hot milk. He wanted hot milk with preface to cr cream. Toast with butter on the side, and he particularly wanted orange marmalade. So the breakfast is pretty simple, pretty basic. Not a lot of cooking to do, mostly just kind of assembling a, a breakfast. So I didn't expect that there would be any kind of historic recipe to follow. But, as it happens, part of this trip took me to the Ruth Payne House. This was the house where Lee Harvey Oswald stayed the night before he assassinated the president. It's really cool because using photos, they've recreated the house to look as close as possible to the way that it would have that November of 1963. This included the kitchen having details like several cookbooks from the period, one of which, the Metropolitan Cookbook, includes a recipe for eggs cooked in shell. For soft cooked eggs, place in boiling water and simmer gently from three to seven minutes, depending on consistency desired. Hard cooked eggs require from 15 to 20 minutes simmering. Unfortunately, there were no other recipes in the books for any components of this breakfast. But we can get some more specifics on how Jack liked his breakfast from none other than his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy. Because in 1958, when Jack was still a Massachusetts senator, Mrs. Kennedy wrote down instructions to their private chef, Tanya Erbst, saying, Mr. K can eat nothing fried. Breakfast, Mr. K, crisp oven broiled bacon, orange juice, pepperidge white toast, coffee, marmalade. And she used the French spelling for marmalade. And in fact, all of the rest of the instructions pretty much are all in French because she was a huge Francophile and wrote a lot of letters in French. Also, she emphasized that the bacon was to be oven broiled, underlining it on the page. And while I can't underline a video, I do want to emphasize that this channel is getting dangerously close to hitting 2 million subscribers, and it'd be really awesome if we did so by the end of the year. So if you haven't subscribed to Tasting History or hit that little notification bell, make sure to do it now and uh, check if you're still subscribed, if you'd subscribed in the past, because sometimes YouTube just unsubscribes people. So since she underlined oven broiled, and since Marvin Love did say that it was supposed to be crisp bacon, we know how to, to make the president's bacon, and it's in the oven. Now, I have baked bacon before, but I've never broiled it. Uh, I'm actually very afraid of broilers because when I first started baking, I, I tried to darken up the top of a pie by putting it under the broiler, and in 30 seconds, the house was filled with smoke but I am going to use the broiler today because the president says so. So, to make oven broiled bacon, set the oven rack to the top position and then turn the broiler on high. Then line a baking pan with some foil. This will stop the bacon from sticking and it will help catch a lot of the grease that uh, invariably will be in that pan and it will make cleanup a lot easier. Then set seven or eight strips of bacon on the pan, making sure they aren't touching. Then set the pan in the oven under the broiler and broil for three minutes or so, and then take it out, flip the bacon over, and return it, broiling it for about another three minutes. But you'll want to keep a sharp eye on this bacon at this point because it can go from crisp to burnt very quickly. See the story about the pie. 
Once it's cooked, remove it from the oven and immediately place the bacon on a plate lined with paper towel to soak up any grease. Now when it comes to the bread, Jackie says it should be Pepperidge White Toast, that is Pepperidge Farm bread, which is cut pretty thick. Unfortunately, of all the things that Pepperidge Farm remembers, selling it uh, in my neck of the woods was, was not one of those things. So I'm just using a generic white bread. And after it's done toasting, it'll be served with some butter and marmalade. As for the president's beverages, it's just some freshly brewed coffee with some milk that has been warmed on the stove and some fresh squeezed orange juice. So I'm using this cool orange reamer that my Nana used to have. It's not the same one, but she had one just like it that she used back in the day. So I reamed some oranges. That doesn't sound right. And then finally, bring some water to simmering and carefully drop a few eggs in and let them boil for exactly five minutes. And Marvin Love did specify five minute eggs, so that's all you're gonna boil them for. And it should be just enough time to let me tell you a bit more about that morning of November 22nd, 1963, in the hours before America changed forever. So what brought President Kennedy to Texas in the first place? Politics, mostly. See, he had won a narrow victory in 1960 in Texas, and in the subsequent years, he'd become quite a bit less popular, mainly due to his stance on civil rights. And perhaps no city was more hostile to the president than Dallas itself. In fact, he had been warned by multiple people not to travel to Dallas. It had a reputation recently for being a very unfriendly city to visit. Only a month earlier, the Kennedy-appointed ambassador to the UN, Adelaide Stevenson, visited the city, and the following day, newspapers said anti-United Nations demonstrators shoved, booed, beat, and spat in the face of Adelaide E. Stevenson following a speech he made here marking United Nations Day. They shoved him about repeatedly. A woman rushed forward and struck him on the head with her picket sign. But despite this and security concerns from his own secret service, he did visit Dallas. He insisted on it because it was so important to mend fences all over Texas should he have any chance of re-election in 1964. What made this trip extra special was the presence of his wife, Jackie Kennedy, who very rarely joined her husband on campaign-related trips. And it was actually her first time out in public in several months as in August of that same year, their newborn son, Patrick, passed away. So, that morning, November 22nd, 1963, after breakfasting in his room, the president got dressed and went downstairs to attend the formal breakfast held by the Chamber of Commerce. There is footage of this entire breakfast, and there is a commentator in the room talking about what's going on. And before the president arrives, he's saying what the president had planned that day. He says that right after the breakfast, There had been plans for him to leave from here in an open car. A convertible is parked outside, but with the rain falling the way it is, it's fairly certain that the top will be up. But it would stop raining, and so the top wasn't up. And it's just crazy to think that something as trivial as a little drizzly rain stopping completely changed the course of American history forever. Another part of the commentary is when he's talking about when the president arrived at the hotel, breaking some security rules. He went out into the crowd, and of course, Secret Service men find this the most nervous time of any presidential appearance. As long as the Secret Service men can keep the crowd away from the president, they have a good chance of protecting him. He then talks about another time that a president broke this rule and that was on September 6th, 1901, and the president was William McKinley. The commentator says, As in many important occasions of the world, no one seemed to sense that anything different was going to happen. Of course, something different did happen. Leon Cholgosh shot President McKinley. That was the last president to be assassinated until that day that the commentator was making the remarks about nobody realizing that anything different was going to happen that day. So at 9, 10 a.m., President John F. Kennedy and his entourage went through the kitchens and entered the Crystal Ballroom, where he received a standing ovation as the Eastern Hills High School Band played Hail to the Chief. But there was someone conspicuously absent. As you may have noticed, Mrs. Kennedy did not enter with the president. So far, we have no indication of where she may be. 
And I can tell you from where we are standing, there are quite a few ladies who appear to be quite disappointed that Mrs. Kennedy is not here. I am sure that if she does not appear, the president will explain uh, the reason for her absence. Jackie was still upstairs, and she had no intention of coming down to attend this breakfast. But it seems that her husband, seeing the empty space right beside him, thought it was not a great look. And so he told one of his Secret Service men to call up to her room and, and get her down here. Well, Jackie's agent, who was actually interviewed for this upcoming documentary, said that he got the call and said, well, no, Mrs. Kennedy had no intention of coming down. She's actually getting ready to leave the hotel. And Jack Kennedy, the president's uh, Secret Service man said, no, 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 you didn't, you didn't get the message. Tell her to get down here now. And so he said, okay, she's on her way. And 20 minutes into breakfast, Jackie Kennedy in a classy raspberry colored suit and pillbox hat entered the ballroom to absolutely uproarious applause. Because while Jack's popularity may have waned, Jackie's had absolutely not. So at this breakfast, President Kennedy gave a speech, which was followed by something that I think is, is actually more interesting than the speech itself. Raymond Buck, the president of the Chamber of Commerce there in Fort Worth, presented Kennedy with a Peters Brothers hat. But Kennedy was famous for not wearing hats. We know that you don't wear a hat. <laughs> couldn't let you leave Fort Worth without providing you with some protection against the rain. It said that the reason that Kennedy rarely wore hats, unless it was part of his outfit, like he wore a top hat at his inauguration, uh, is because he was afraid that an ill-timed photo wearing a certain hat might l make him look like a bit of a buffoon, because there was evidence that that had happened before. See Calvin Coolidge's photo wearing a Native American headdress from 40 years earlier. It was a lesson not learned by Michael Dukakis in 1988 when he had a famous photo in a tank wearing a helmet that many say kind of ruined his bid for presidency that year. So no hats for Kennedy, and he refuses to put it on there, but he does allow Buck to try it on in his stead. But then he says, I'll put it on in the uh, White House on Monday. If you'll come up there, you'll have a chance to see it then. <laughs> And then following the breakfast, the hatless president and his wife fly to Dallas. Now, if you know the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you'll know that you don't fly from one to the other. It's like 30 miles apart, so you don't fly. But that day, they didn't have enough people to close off all of the on-ramps on the freeway, so they needed to fly. They also wanted the airplane there at Love Field, so right after the motorcade and a, a luncheon, they could fly off to Austin for dinner that night. There was a lot of eating on this presidential trip. So the Kennedys arrive at Love Field to meet Texas Governor John Conley and his wife, even though they were both at the breakfast with the Kennedys, and then they get into the limousine. Now, it had stopped raining, so there was no weather-related reason that the car needed to have the roof on. But the, the Secret Service urged the president to keep the roof on for, for security reasons. But the president refused and wanted it to be a convertible so there would be nothing between him and the people on the parade route. Now, today, the Secret Service would just say, well, too bad, Mr. President, it's, it's our job to keep you safe. But in 1963, there seemed to be less of a concern that someone would try to assassinate the president, especially from afar. So the limo was left as a convertible. 10 miles the motorcade went, driving through the streets of Dallas, which were absolutely packed with people vying to catch a glimpse of the president and Mrs. Kennedy. Through downtown Dallas it went, where surrounded by high-rise buildings, there was the most danger of something going wrong. But they made it through that part of the city safely, without incident, and so the Secret Service could kind of let out a bit of a sigh of relief as they turned onto Houston Street, going into Dealey Plaza. The crowds were cheering for the president as they turned left onto Elm Street, and Nellie Connolly, the governor's wife, turned to Kennedy and said, Well, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. And he replied, no, you certainly can't. And then three shots rang out from the very last building on the route, from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about what happened after. First of all, I think a lot of people know the story. Um, and second of all, this would be a two-hour episode if I did. But if you don't know 
much about the Kennedy assassination. The story is, is fascinating, what happens over the next 48 hours. Like I said, there's a documentary from National Geographic coming out this weekend about it. It's a pivotal moment in American history really worth looking into. But while I'm not going to cover the assassination itself, there are two more food-related aspects to the assassination that, that I did want to cover because I found them just so interesting. I saw both when I visited the Sixth Floor Museum, which is, as the name would suggest, on the sixth floor of the school book depository where Oswald was when he assassinated the president. In the museum, you can see the spot where he sat looking out the window, and it's set up just as it was that day, surrounded by boxes of books, so he couldn't be seen by anyone coming up to that floor or looking in any of the windows. But one thing that's missing from the recreation, or at least I didn't see it, was some fried chicken, because it turns out that when police swarmed the building, they also found the remnants of fried chicken and an empty Coke bottle. Presumably the meal that Lee Harvey Oswald ate just before he assassinated Kennedy. Also as haunting as it is to be there in that spot where American history changed forever, world history really, it's even more haunting if you just turn around and see a place setting never used. It was the actual place setting from the Dallas Trademark Luncheon, which was where President Kennedy was headed before the motorcade had to change course to Parkland Hospital. This was the actual place setting that had been reserved for President Kennedy. And there's even a photo on the wall of attendees of this luncheon as they hear the news that the president was dead. A sobering thought to keep in mind as I eat this, the last meal of President John F. Kennedy. And here we are, President Kennedy's last breakfast. So I don't exactly know what to, what to try first, but I think I'm gonna go with the egg because uh, it's, it's gonna get cold real fast. Unfortunately, I do have an egg white allergy, uh, so I'm just gonna get some of the yolk. Um, it's definitely a lot more runny than, than I like my eggs. Sorry, I'm just, I don't wanna go into anaphylactic shock. Tastes like egg yolk. Um, I don't like, I don't really like like sunny side up eggs or anything with that runny yolk. It's just, it's not my cup of tea, but um, it was JFK's clearly. The, uh, the next thing I'm gonna try is the bacon because I'm hoping I got it nice and crisp per the president's request. Yeah, mm. Man, bacon is just the best thing ever. I made a whole pound. I'm not gonna eat a whole pound right now. Then I'll take a bite of this toast with marmalade and butter. I could have toasted it more. It's a little soft. It's very thick. Probably the problem. Coffee. Tastes like coffee. And finally, the fresh squeezed orange juice. Now that's delicious. I do love some fresh squeezed orange juice. Honestly, the meal is very simple, so the tasting is very simple, but the idea behind it, the history behind that morning, anything but simple. What is simple is making your own website using today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the easy way to build a website. With drag and drop tools like their new Fluid Engine, you can customize the site to make it your own. And with a huge selection of website templates, you can be sure your own is streamlined and easy to use. Perfect for your personal website or for your business website. And Squarespace is perfect for business and customers. They make it easy for your customers to navigate your site and keep them up to date with new products via their blogging tools and their email campaigns. And Squarespace helps you track orders, manage inventory, and everything else that has to do with bookkeeping, the least favorite part of any business owner. So if you're looking to build a website, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash tasting history for 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. And I will see you next time on Tasting History.